I mean, it makes me a little bit sad because your work is both um, from a computer science perspective, fascinating and the inference engine from a epistemological philosophical aspect, fascinating. But you know, it is also you're running a company and there's some stuff that has to remain private and it's sad. Well, here, here's something that may make you feel better, mm -hmm. a little bit better. Um, we're, um, we've formed a, a not-for-profit not company uh, called the Knowledge Activization Institute, NAX, K-N-A-X. Mm -hmm. And I have this firm belief with a lot of empirical evidence to support it that the, the education that people get in high schools, in colleges, in graduate schools, and so on, is almost completely orthogonal to, almost completely irrelevant to how good they're going to be at coming up to speed in doing this kind of ontological engineering and writing these assertions and rules and so on in, in psych. And so very often we'll interview candidates who have their PhD in philosophy, who've taught logic for years and so on, and they're just, they're just awful. But the converse is true. So one of the best ontological engineers we ever had never graduated high school. And so the purpose of um, Knowledge Axiomatization Institute, if we can get some, some foundations to help support it, is identify people in the general population, maybe high school dropouts, who have latent talent for this sort of thing, um, offer them effectively scholarships to train them, and then help place them in companies that need more trained ontological engineers, some of which would be working for us, but mostly would be working for partners or customers or something. And if we could do that, that would create an enormous number of um, relatively very high paying jobs for people who currently um, have no, no way out of some you know, um, situation that they're locked into. So is there something you can put into words that describes somebody who would be great at ontological engineering. So what characteristics about a person make them a great at this task? This task of converting the messiness of human language <laughs> and knowledge yes. into formal logic. This is very much like what um, Alan Turing had to do during World War II uh, in trying to find people to bring to Bletchley Park, mm -hmm. where he would publish in the London Times cryptic crossword puzzles along with some, some innocuous looking note, which essentially said, if, if you were able to solve this puzzle in less than 15 minutes, please call this phone number <laughs> and so on. So, um, you know, or uh, back when I was young, there was uh, uh, the practice of having uh, matchbooks where on the inside of the matchbook, um, there would be a, can you draw this? You have a career in art, mm -hmm. a commercial art, if you can copy this uh, drawing, uh, you know, and so on. So um, yes, the, the analog of that. Was there a little test to get to the core of whether it yes. can be good or not? So part of it has to do with uh, being able to um, make and appreciate um, um, and react negatively appropriately to puns and other jokes. So you have to have a kind of sense of humor. And if you're good at uh, telling jokes and um, good at understanding jokes, that's that's one indicator. Like puns? Yes. Like dad jokes? Yes. Well, maybe not dad jokes, but real, but funny jokes. Um, but- uh, I think I'm applying to work as psych work. <laughs> yeah, but um, another, another is if you're able to introspect. So very often um, uh, we'll, we'll give someone a simple question and we'll say like, um, um, wh wh why, why is this? And, you know, sometimes they'll just say, because it is, okay, that's a bad sign. But very often they'll be able to introspect and so on. So one of the questions um, I often ask is I'll point to a sentence with a pronoun in it and I'll say, um, you know, the referent of that pronoun is obviously this noun over here. Um, you know, how would you or I or an AI or a five-year-old, 10-year-old child know that that pronoun refers to that noun over here? Um, and um, often um, the people who are going to be good at ontological engineering will give me some causal explanation or will refer to some things that are true in the world. So if you imagine a sentence like, the horse was led into the barn while its head was still wet. And so its head refers to the horse's head. But how do you know that? 
And so some people will say, I just know it. Some people will say, well, the horse was the subject of the sentence. And I'll say, okay, well, what about the horse was led into the barn while its roof was still wet? Now, its roof obviously refers to the barn. Um, and so uh, then they'll say, oh, well, that's because it's the closest noun and so on. So basically, if they try to give me answers which are based on syntax and grammar and so on, that's a really bad sign. But if they're able to say things like, well, horses have heads and barns don't, and barns have roofs and horses don't, um, then that's a positive sign that they're going to be good at this because they can introspect on what's true in the world that leads you to know certain things. How fascinating is it that getting a PhD makes you less capable to introspect deeply about this kind oh, of Oh, I'm not, I wouldn't I wouldn't <laughs> no. go that far. I'm not saying that it makes you less capable. Let's just say it's independent of Oh, I don't um, know about of how, this. of how good okay, people are. You're not saying that. I'm <laughs> saying that there's a certain it's it's interesting that for a lot of people uh, PhDs uh sorry, philosophy aside that sometimes education narrows your thinking versus expands it. Yes. It's kind of fascinating. And for certain, when you're trying to do ontological engineering, which is essentially teach our future AI overlords how to reason deeply about this world and how to understand it, that that requires that you think deeply about the world. So I'll, I'll tell you a sad story about MathCraft, which is why is that not widely used in schools today? Um, we're not really trying to make big profit on it or anything like that. that when we, we've gone to schools, their attitude has been, well, if a student spends 20 hours going through this math craft program from start to end and so on, um, will it improve their score on this standardized test more than if they spent 20 hours just doing mindless drills of problem after problem after problem? And the answer is, well, no, but it'll increase their understanding more. And their attitude is, well, if it doesn't increase their score on this test, um, then that's not, you know, we're not going to adopt it. 